Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why am I focused on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! Welcome to Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Agriculture as if the Planet Mattered. In these interviews, I'm talking to people who are scaling up the sector, either by increasing the influx of capital or by working on the ground to scale up the enterprises on the ground. Why regenerative agriculture? Because so many of the world current issues come together in this subject, from drought to water scarcity, climate change, social issues, hunger, obesity, all have a connection to how we grow food and what we eat. You're going to listen to an interview with Dr. Sarah Shear, founder and CEO of Eco Agriculture Partners. We we'll talk about stranded assets. 11 trillion of stranded assets are stuck in agriculture. We'll talk about the importance of good landscape partnerships and how, as a smart impact investor, you can recognize partnerships that actually add value where all the stakeholders are involved and the need for new institutions to really get this movement to scale. Enjoy. So welcome to Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Agriculture as if the Planet Mattered. I'm Koen van Seyen, the host of today. In the podcast of today, we have Dr. Sarah Scheer, Agricultural and Natural Resource Economist, CEO and co-founder of Eco Agricultural Partners, plus author of many books and papers. For instance, Scaling Up the Investment Finance for Integrated Landscape Management, where for the first time, at least I've read it there for the first time, people speak about the stranded assets in agriculture. So we're definitely going to ask more about that. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much, Kun. It's a pleasure to be with you. And to start, as I like to start with a personal question, how did you end up in the regenerative ecological agriculture space? Well, I'm probably one of, I'm one of those unusual people who's actually been interested in that question since I was about 19 years old. And I was uh, doing some of my early field work in the rainforests of Costa Rica and looking at the kinds of agriculture that made sense and didn't make sense in that kind of environment. And that inspired me to go on to uh, study agricultural economics and study agroforestry and natural resource management. So I've been looking at this question my whole life for a very long time, focusing on those areas where agronomists said it was hard or maybe we shouldn't be doing agriculture in rainforests and drylands and steep hillsides, particularly throughout the tropics. And I was so constantly looking at this um, relationship between uh, agricultural production and livelihoods for for farmers and the um, management of the soils and the water and the vegetation and the biodiversity and the places where they were working. So I did that work for a really long time. And I was a researcher uh, also doing development work for about 25 years. And I started in the year 2000, I got involved in several research projects that were looking globally at land use, trying to look at the relationship between agricultural production areas and important ecosystem services. And I found to my astonishment that the remote sensing data actually showed that the most important areas for biodiversity, for carbon sinks, uh, terrestrial carbon sinks, for watershed management were actually in the prime agricultural areas of the world. And this was really quite a shock for me because I realized that the issues that I had been facing all those years in what they used to call marginal lands 
were actually just as true of our bread baskets and rice bowls. And that the way that we manage our agriculture in those places was absolutely central to, to long-term provisioning of water, to long-term conservation of biodiversity, wildlife, etc. cetera. Uh, so it really gave me a new look at things and realized that the we need to be looking at agriculture uh, not as something that is separate from uh, environmental management, but as one of the most important tools that we have. And so then I thought, well, then the big challenge we face moving forward in this next generation is to find agricultural systems that are actually not just a little bit less bad uh, for the environment, but are actually positively um, contributing to healthy watersheds, to wildlife habitat, to uh, terrestrial uh, climate change mitigation, etc. So that's what really sparked my interest in thinking about this issue, not only at the farm level, but at, at a much larger landscape scales. Yeah, I really like the, the not less bad, but more good um metaphor definition i think it really captures a whole new paradigm almost of of agriculture instead of of um, really looking at making sure we do it in a way that it's maybe slightly less bad or cutting less trees etc we're looking at a way okay how do we bring back a lot of the biodiversity and use it as a as a huge tool and have, have you seen a lot of change in the perception because you were for sure one of the first that started looking at that um in in the like in 2000 till maybe a few years ago and then a few years ago until now, were there really big changes in the perception of people and the responses in the companies you're working with, the organizations, etc.? Well, I think that one of the things that you've been seeing over the last decade is much wider recognition of the importance of environmental issues to agriculture. But I would say that the focus has been more of a preoccupation about the controlling the negative effects of agriculture uh, on the environment. I think there's still not a very widespread recognition of just how important environmental management is to the productivity and long-term sustainability and resilience of, of production agriculture itself. I think that's, to me, the, the change in the mental model that we still need to see. And it also means that people are then not being quite as creative at, at thinking about what those investments need to look like. They're not thinking about their agriculture investments within this broader context of what kinds of land uses and land management are actually surrounding them. To me, this is actually one of the big changes that has happened in just the last couple of years. One of the things that we've been doing uh, at Eco Agriculture Partners for the last 15 years is to try to document and study and understand how are these integrated landscape management strategies work. And we've documented with partners around the world uh, more than 420 of these large-scale landscape partnerships where farmers and conservation organizations and local governments and social NGOs and nutrition folks, et cetera, have partnered together in landscapes where it was very clear that none of them working separately was going to address very serious issues of natural resource conflict or natural resource degradation. Uh, and some of these other concerns that have been really arising all around the world. So people have been doing this kind of work for quite some time. Uh, and I think it was a bit of a of an unrecognized secret uh, just how much these local situations were giving rise to new kinds of partnerships, new kinds of institutions to, to try to transform landscapes to become much more sustainable for all of the people that are living in them, uh, to produce all of the products that are needed and all of the ecosystem services and livelihoods that people in those landscapes uh, need to have. What you had was very little recognition at the policy level um, and certainly very little recognition within the financial institutions. And one quite remarkable thing is if you look at these 420 landscapes that we documented between 2013 and 2015 that had all been established for uh, at least three years. They had platforms for negotiation among the stakeholder groups. They were developing action plans, etc. There was only a quarter of them had any agribusiness or food industry partners in them and other private sector actors. Um, and we were really quite surprised by this, particularly since the focus of all of these was on production agriculture landscapes. And so to not have private sector actors, uh, apart from farmer organizations, those were very, very uh, common in all of the, the landscapes. 
But there was this surprising lack of, of business involvement. Uh, in, in Africa, it actually was only 8% of all the landscape initiatives that had business partners. So you're saying, well, wait a minute, agriculture is basically a private sector business. Um, so how can it be that, uh, you, that they've not been part of this? And so we- Yeah, why is that? Well, it was, you know, part of it simply was that in the minds of most companies, they want to focus on the farms they work in, they want to park, focus on their supply chains. All of the interventions that we think about, whether it's from a production point of view, or even a sustainability point of view, were largely at the farm level and within supply chains. If you look at certification as a strategy, if you look at supply chain standards, et cetera, that is really the way the agricultural sector is largely structured. Also, government entities involved in agriculture are structured really at those two levels, rather than at the larger landscape level. So they didn't have the the... They weren't used to thinking about the problem as something that they needed to solve at the larger landscape scale. And obviously, they're not going to do anything there's not a good business case for. So one of the things that to me has been the biggest change, you ask, over the last couple of years has been the burgeoning recognition by many of the actors in the agriculture production and food industry space that many of their most important sourcing regions are actually at risk and that it's going to be hurting the business. The most common risks are concerns about water access, water quality, and water security. So you have brewing companies, for example, that all of a sudden are getting very interested in being involved with multi-stakeholder watershed management programs because they really need to ensure that for the next 50 years there's good water sources. You have all of these companies that have made commitments to deforestation-free supply chains that have realized that it's not sufficient to do farm-level certification if those farms that are supplying them are in the middle of forests where many other actors are continuing to, to do deforestation. They then have no credibility for their certification. So those groups are now starting to recognize that they need to partner with other actors in the landscape uh, to try to have collaborative solutions to, uh, to addressing deforestation. Uh, you also have companies that are seeing issues related to climate change and the need for climate change adaptation that also want to partner with other institutions to co-invest in some of the activities and programs and business models that will allow them to adapt uh, more effectively to climate change. So I think you're starting to see much more recognition about the uh, potential business advantages of being part of these landscape uh, partnerships. But at the same time, you have a really pretty start of a learning curve, I think, for everyone in how to make those partnerships actually be effective. Yeah, and, and if you look at what, what has changed then in the past few years, that suddenly at least a number of these groups in agriculture, either companies, processing companies, etc., started to look beyond their own farm or beyond their own supplier. What, what has triggered that? Let's look outside beyond the gate, basically, of what I'm used to. I would say for most of them, it is looking at business risks, and they're seeing risks that they can't manage uh, within the confines of their own company or their own supply chain. So I think that's the biggest one. And I guess say climate water, I think some of the community issues about establishing um, a long-term um, right to operate in, in places where there's many other actors that are competing for some of the same resources that are important for the companies. So I think that's part of what you're, you're starting to see is a recognition of risk. There are some real far-sighted companies that are actually turning that on its head and are, see, are actually making commitments from the level of their board of directors uh, that say, we are committed to long-term sustainability in our operations and in our businesses. We see partnerships with other actors who share the resource base with us as actually being uh, one of the core principles of our business. So I would say there's not too many of those yet, but you're actually starting to see it move from simply a risk analysis to a shifting of business models as something where they recognize that the long-term sustainability of the landscapes they're operating with and the, and the economic, social, and ecological health of the other actors in those landscapes actually are part of the, of the plan for achieving success within their businesses. That's almost moving from a, a, a less negative, in this case risk, to a few that are actually seeing the positive uh, potential almost from from a risk management to hey, actually this is full of opportunities if I'm doing it right which isn't easy but at least uh, it, it's possible which of course the, the 400 cases you've you've looked at 
or at least the quarter that was involved with uh, with agriculture uh, business um, have been showing. Right. And I think the other landscapes are desperately trying to engage businesses in the work. And in many cases, they haven't been successful to. And one of the things that we've been working with is tools and methods and analyses uh, that will help some of those existing landscape initiatives reach out to businesses and help them consider the business case. Uh, for participating. We've also been trying to look at working with businesses to see how they can uh, do their own internal assessments of when and when it makes sense and, and how it makes sense, what kind of roles are appropriate for them, depending upon the kind of business that they have. Now, one of the things I think that is constraining of this is that most of our major institutions don't support this kind of integrated landscape management. So our policies and government rules and uh, the ways that government agencies operate regulations and make public sector investments are still very... Very much siloed. Very, very siloed, very sectoral. And at the same time, so are the financial institutions. So if you have a business that has got together with a some NGOs and the local government and have agreed to co-invest in, let's say, riparian restoration uh, so as to improve water quality for all of the actors that are depending upon that water, they often can't get any financing for that because the finance is also itself quite uh, siloed by sector and also uh, quite differentiated in terms of whether the um, investor or the person getting the loan or the grant or the or the equity investment is in the public, private or civic sphere. So if you're really looking at how do we scale up good practices at the farm, forest, outside the agricultural areas, but, but that have impact on agricultural areas, uh, so that you may have, a, a in order to scale up, to restore watershed functions. We, we work in a number of landscapes where they've managed to actually get rivers that were no longer running all year round. They got enough land users around all of the rivers, all the farmers that were using irrigation, et cetera, to shift their practices. So those rivers are now running all year round, which of course is quite transformational, not only for agricultural production, but also for biodiversity and for many other services that are in that landscape. But you need to be able to have all of the actors do complementary and coordinated activities in order to achieve change that will really be transformative at scale. And we have very few financial models for doing that. So people have to kind of jerry-rig the the finance and and put it together. And um, there's a real need for, you know, we call a sort of a a financial aggregator uh, or financial coordinators brokers that say, okay, if we're going to actually restore this degraded area over there, the protected area is going to have to do these things there, and the the coffee farmers are going to have to do these things, and then the maize farmers are going to have to do that, and then the local government um, infrastructure is going to have to shift from using this to that practice. Um, you need to have somebody who says, okay, what, what's the financing plan uh, for this action plan. So you have many of these landscape initiatives, actually most of them, they spend a few years coming together with a sh- to get a shared understanding of how the landscape's actually operating and where the risks are and where the opportunities are and where the trade-offs are and where the synergies are. And they develop an action plan. But what we're finding is that they very few of them actually then develop a financing strategy that would allow the investments that need to take place uh, among the different uh, land users, among the different farmers, the different agribusinesses or food industries and, and other actors that are that are affecting the land use to, um, to, to achieve the impacts at scale that they need. Yeah, and then, then often what you see or what at least I, I see from a bit outside the space is that the, the people on the ground running uh, interesting projects, uh, the farms that are scaling up their regenerative agriculture practices, etc., cannot find the financing and are complaining uh, that there are no good investors and then the investors you talk to say they cannot find the projects and the companies to invest in because there are no good investments and probably the truth is somewhere in the middle and has to do with language etc but you've been describing I've, I've read two ways of one is is helping those people on the ground to to get to that financial plan how, how would it work as a sort of incubator or, or help to 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 when, when after you've made the ecosystem plan and the landscape plan to also make the financial plan to do that how are you working in that uh, that uh, part of the sector at the moment 
Well, I think then you identified the fact that the issue is actually on both sides, and I actually think they're both true. Um, we do find that uh, many of the many of the groups that are the the best at designing regenerative agriculture investments, even at scale, uh, don't have a very good sense of are very bad at designing financial systems. They don't understand what kinds of financial institutions would potentially be interested in that kind of investment, given the time frame, the scale, the nature of the flow of returns, and those things. So they they go after the wrong financial groups. They think, oh, I I'll go to a bank for this, but that's actually not the kind of investment that a bank would ever give you. Uh, you need to go to an impact investor for that, or maybe you need to get some blended finance. Uh, you're finding some extremely interesting, innovative partnerships around finance that are happening, whereby civil society groups, private uh, sector groups, and sometimes governments will come in to co-finance particular activities. So there's a lot of uh, innovation going on in this space. It's just that, uh, so on the one hand, while they're trying to sort out their own understanding of finance, uh, on the other side, the financial institutions are often quite so rigid in the kinds of their definition about the kinds of things that they finance uh, that they're not exploring in a creative enough way uh, new models of finance. And I think this is also one of the things that's changed so much in the last couple of years. We are seeing the most innovative experiments going on, I would say some of them are, about how they can connect different actors uh, within a landscape and all of it taking place within the frame of an agreed, you know, long-term action plan so that it's complementary with what others are doing within the landscape. So I'm, I'm quite encouraged by the amount of innovation that's going on. Uh, but I think until the, the financial sector quite seriously looks at how they can address the need for these kinds of more sustainable, multi-objective, multi-actor investment situations, uh, we will be limited in terms of how far we can go. And I think you're starting to see that happen. You're starting to see now even some of the larger uh, financial institutions uh, be implementing uh, certain lines of, of, of finance to explore. Uh, how they can how they can make a change in the way that th that they're doing, but at the same time, I think there is a, a really important role for the development of incubators, for the development of, of of aggregators who can work with these landscape groups that have both the financial expertise, but also have an understanding of what is the nature of the kinds of, of, of financial investments that are needed. One, one of the important things that we've learned from, from our work with, with doing landscape finance is that it's important to distinguish between um, the asset investments, which are the investments that are actually going to change what's going on with the production system or with the natural resource management that's going to change the infrastructure, whether it's built infrastructure or natural infrastructure, et cetera. That's one, you know, you have your short-term and your long-term asset investments. You have your, your high return, your, your lower return ones. Each of those need to have a different segment of the financing sector to be available to them. But at the same time, you've got a, other investments that we call the enabling investments, which are the ones that enable you to achieve scale. They're the ones that provide uh, tr training in new regenerative agricultural practices to hundreds of thousands of farmers rather than just 5,000 farmers. They are these um, incubation roles uh, to support, to bring some of these novel kinds of investments uh, to become investable. They are the roles for documenting the performance both of the businesses and the performance of the landscape, uh, because one of the things that financial institutions look for is track record. So we've got a real problem with these landscape, these novel landscape investments. They just have not developed a track record. And even where they have, that track record has not been well documented and shared with the institutions. So I think there's a whole lot of other roles, uh, the landscape. Field building almost. Yes, exactly. You're really creating, you know, in some senses, new institutions. Uh, and I think that's what we need to think about uh, for something really transformational. If we're, if we're gonna see the agricultural sector move from being the greatest threat to our water resources to become one of the greatest tools for conserving water. We want to see agriculture move from being the greatest threat to biodiversity to become one of the most important habitats to help support networks and habitat networks for, 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 for species. Do you want to see it move from becoming one of the most important contributors 
to of greenhouse gases to being one of the most important sources of sequestration of greenhouse gases. We have to think about change at scale, and it is going to imply changes in our financial institutions. Um, and, and I think the businesses are starting to move in that direction. I think the financial system is not moving as quickly. Um, and I think that's one of the one of the top priorities for for making this approach really deliver its its promise. And and if you look at at a slightly more practical level at your work at the moment, um, what have you been busy with? Um, of course, if you can share that uh, for the last few months, and what will, what what kept you up at night, basically, and, and what will keep you up at night for the next few months. <laughs> Oh, that's a great question. Actually, what's been keeping me up at night have been have been good things. Too much work, but good things. Um, I just came uh, at, finished about two weeks ago a, a, a really incredibly inspiring experience in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, uh, where we helped to organize um, a, a meeting of 140 individuals who are leading African landscape initiatives. Uh, from all over, from 17 countries. And these were movers and shakers. These were people who were actually implementing these landscape partnerships, were totally in it. And it was an opportunity for them to share experiences and to identify what was going well and what wasn't going well. So I spent a lot of the last couple months uh, helping to organize a, a, a really fruitful and creative kind of meeting. And one of the, two, two of the most important uh, subjects that were discussed there were the role of businesses and how to strengthen and, and have really uh, productive roles of businesses in these landscape initiatives. And, and another one of the topics was around finance and what kind of innovations in finance were there. So what came out of that meeting was a set of priorities in Africa for uh, scaling up uh, integrated landscape management uh, with, an, with an agriculture focus uh, throughout the, the continent. And uh, we had a number of important institutions from the, from the public sector, some from the private sector and civil society sector, who made commitments to move forward on activities uh, such as the development of an incubator uh, for East Africa that would support landscape initiatives, uh, developing a community of practice of individuals interested in developing uh, new forms of, of, of uh, landscape finance, of developing um, an outreach campaign with some of the financial institutions to educate them about the kinds of financial opportunities that there were, uh, but informed by, you know, by people who actually know <laughs> how to wow. tell what is a good financial opportunity and what isn't. So there was a whole series of, of, of outcomes from that meeting and we're already seeing um, follow-up uh, from of those, uh, we ourselves are, are supporting an, a network of uh, landscape initiatives in um, Kenya and in Ethiopia and in Tanzania that have started to do very active uh, sharing and exchange and also collaboratively going to policymakers when they need to see a policy change that will make it easier for them to operate in these in in, in these places. And you're also seeing this new mobilization of uh, private sector actors. Uh, from particularly from agribusiness and the the food industry, also from the forestry forestry sector, and and bioenergy sectors as well, that are are looking at uh, these new opportunities for uh, landscape investments, um, and for investments that will 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 deliver landscape benefits. And I think one of the messages that I would say to to investors is. If you are planning to support agriculture or forestry or some of these other natural resource management um, activities, go to a place where there is already an organized landscape partnership that has done their homework about what's working and what's not working, where the threats are, what are the kinds of changes that are needed where in the landscape, and that would provide some guidance and sort of vision of where they're going, because that is likely to very significantly reduce risks for you and doing your because you know where your company you know where your investment fits within a larger plan of landscape and, and, and action and also there are partners there who understand what you want to get and can come in to do things like co-invest with you on infrastructure that you might jointly need or could come in and provide say the training that your the farmers you're working with need without necessarily as much cost to you. So I think there's some real opportunities that are just, just becoming realized there. So I'm quite excited about uh, what's going to happen over this next year. And, and when you are, as, as hopefully everybody is a smart impact investor, looking at different landscapes or different landscape partnerships, 
how do you recognize a good one? How should a master plan, should one of those plans look? Which questions should you ask um, if you are doubting between two or three to become active? Of course, you should do more as, much, as many as possible. But let's say you can only do one. Um, what would be a, a few smart questions to ask from your perspective? No, I think it's a really good question. And it's so interesting that just in the last like two years, that question is, is coming up for people as they get serious about doing this. We're actually involved in the development of a couple of tools uh, to assess to what extent, to how, how well landscape partnerships are actually operating internally. Uh, that's actually already been developed and is being widely tested. We're in the process right now of uh, testing and training in the use of a new tool to assess the governance of landscapes, which is certainly one of the things that they're very interested. Um, and uh, and also a third tool <laughs> uh, that we're doing with collaboratively with a couple of other partners, um, trying to answer specifically that question for investors. And I think some of the key, if there's a, there's, they have quite a checklist of the kinds of things that they should be looking at. Uh, but, but one of them is whether there is a established sort of a commitment within the landscape among uh, key partners around a, a future vision that some of the homework has already been done about where people consider to be the sensitive spots, uh, what are the kinds of production systems that are that, that will will fit with the with the plans for moving forward, uh, where are some of the new opportunities? I would certainly uh, want to look at where there is go to work in places where there's already significant thinking about market innovations about finding ways to make money at the farm level or within ecotourism or payments for ecosystem services, et cetera, but where people are already thinking about a vision where production and agriculture and business are going to be good also for environmental uh, concerns and, and social concerns. So you want to look be, work in places where those conversations have been taking place for some time. You want to look for a place where the business, where the government, the local governments are at least supportive, if not playing a leadership role in some of these uh, initiatives and that you know that the kind of policy framework in which you would be operating is gonna be supportive for this kind of a business. So those are some of the kinds of things that we, we look at. Obviously there's questions that are the typical ones around land tenure, around um, access to skilled, skilled people, et cetera. But I think being in a place where there's commitment already to collaborative investment and collaborative action is, is a real plus for an investor. No, it's great. And also, I'm, I'm very look, much looking forward to share if, of course, when, when the tool is ready and, and public, the tool for, for screening for interesting landscapes for, for investors. And let's say, hopefully, some of the, the, the listeners to this podcast are working at a, a larger financial institution. You, you've mentioned in your um, publication in 2015 about the 11 trillion stranded assets. So what does that refer to? We all know the divest invest movement of fossil fuels, I hope. And and I've seen a bit of push to, to look at agriculture in the same way. But could you explain briefly, if I'm in a big financial institution, probably I have exposure to agriculture. Why should I be worried? Yeah, I, I think there's, a, I guess, two things that I want to say about that. The first is why you should be worried. And secondly, about some of the innovations that are actually uh, coming, coming around to, to address that. There is no question that we have First of all, the level of degradation globally in agricultural lands is is remarkably high. Uh, it's estimated to be 30 to 40 percent of agricultural lands have some form of, of, of degradation. Now, uh, some of those forms of degradation can be offset to some extent. For example, some of the loss of fertility can be offset to some extent, uh, you know, with fertilizers. Uh, some of the loss of of, of infiltration of water can be offset by better water systems. But many of those are actually creating chronic losses in productivity, and uh, it's moving in a, in a very big downward spiral. I, I work, for example, in one area of Tanzania where they have identified rice production as one of the most exciting and profitable opportunities for investors of all types. A recent study there found 100% of all the farms surveyed already had substantial salinization in their rice fields, which is does not bode well for the future. So I think there's been almost a putting your head in the sand by many agricultural investors and many people in the agricultural community who think you can solve all the problems with better seed, better fertilizer, better pest control, and better markets. And all of those things are extremely important, but they will not address 
major climate changes, if all of a sudden wind velocities are much higher uh, going through your orchard, you will get major losses. And so if you're not going to do something about landscape configurations and establishing wind breaks, you're going to have very substantial losses in agriculture. And I think in general, um, there, there is, is simply a, a myopia. Uh, most of the screening criteria for good agricultural investments today actually don't look at the sustainability of water supplies. They don't look at the long-term productivity of the soils. Uh, they don't look at the impacts that climate change is going to have on production characteristics. And they're not looking at where the farm is in relationship to larger ecological and, and, and economic processes within the landscape. So I think that there are many assets out there that should be valued much lower than what they are right now because these factors have not been looked at. So I totally think this is going to be an issue. And it's going to be exacerbated by the fact that you're starting to have in some crops and in some some parts of the world, uh, increasing demand from the from the industries that use the products uh, that they don't want deforestation to be associated with their products. They don't want water loss to be associated with their with their products. So they're going to start looking at this from from, from that perspective. And many things that look like they'd be really good assets. Uh, will no longer be. So I absolutely think this is something uh, for for financial institutions to be to be careful about. Now on the positive side, there's just started to be uh, some efforts at developing um, investment screens on some of these issues. If you go to the International Finance Corporation, for example, they've got some uh, standards that require you to look at some aspects of a landscape, such as uh, such as water and the sustainability of water supplies for those for those areas. There's also the the Millennium Challenge Corporation, for example, developed something called a landscape lifescape analysis, and we're using it as a screen for investments in Indonesia that individual companies needed to. Show show how their operation was connected with other things in the landscape that could potentially increase their risks or, or reduce their risks. Um, and I think that was a fairly novel tool. But but overall, I would say that um, this is not being carefully uh, looked at. I was just uh, speaking last last June at, at a meeting with a bunch of agribusiness and food industry people from from around the world looking specifically at this question of how to how to do effective landscape partnerships and there was an example given uh, from South Africa where one of the great achievements that was being tooted by uh, by the government and by the Chamber of Commerce uh, was uh, the development of an investment area where they had attracted something like 15 uh, uh, agribusiness and food industries to all come to that valley and uh, and operate and set up new manufacturing plants, et cetera. And this was a big success. Well, it turns out that when you put all 15 of those companies there, they their demand for water far out outreached uh, the availability of water in that area. And you started to, almost within a few years have some of those companies uh, have to go out of business. They're just not looking at the ecosystem sustainability of these systems at scale. They're looking in the short term at their own plot of land, but they're not looking at how that plot of land is linked with the larger um, the larger landscape. Yeah, and I think that, that really summons it up. Look beyond your gate, beyond your fence, beyond your plot of land whatever the size, if it's half an acre uh, in, in Kenya or a few hundred thousand in, in Australia, you're still part of a larger ecosystem and you can't escape that. You are. And on the positive side, there are great opportunities that open when you look across that fence line. There are people to co-invest with you. There's people who can reduce their your, the risks that you face. There's people who can co uh, develop coalitions with you to, to look for more favor, favorable kinds of and supportive policy measures. So I think it's both the negative and, and to keep in mind the, the positives of doing that. Yeah, and I think any long-term investor has to have, in any investment, a, a holistic view, especially in agriculture, but of course also in energy, education, etc. How does that fit in a larger system? doesn't make it easier to screen but does make it a lot less um, prone to risk and probably uh, have a lot more opportunities, especially in the long term. Yeah, I've had a number of people who've spoken to me about um, that, that, that we are kind of in agriculture where we were maybe with sustainable agriculture 30 years ago. You mean in sustainable energy? Yeah, you know, the finance people didn't know much about it. You know, a lot of businesses didn't know much about it. We didn't have very many good models for it. And that this is really just a, a learning process. These are new markets. These are new and new new approaches. And yeah, yeah. In other words, that, that that sort of that process happened 30 years ago. 
with with sustainable energy. And now, of course, we have massive amounts of, of finance and many businesses, et cetera. And people know what that looks like. They know what the types are. They know what the risks are associated with it. It's a, it's a sector and it has a track record and their numbers. Yeah. It's a mature sector. And so I think we need to look at the sustainable agriculture and sustainable agricultural landscape world as just we are still in the sort of early years of that. And I think if we can be quite proactive, we've learned, we can learn a lot from other sectors uh, in term, and we can learn from the urban sectors. They've also done integrated investment programs that we probably could learn quite a lot about how they finance that and apply that to agriculture. Um, but I think it does require that effort of, of, of innovative groups uh, among the, the people who know the land, among the people who farm, who know the markets, who know the finance, who know the business, uh, and, the, and they know the governments to, to, to pull together to actually move this from a, a kind of an infant industry to, uh, to a much more mature industry, which I think we could, could absolutely get to in the next 30 years. Yeah, and hopefully with those lessons, actually speed it up yeah. and, and save us from some of the mistakes they have made and, and get to a more mature, which... I think are really we've reached maybe five years ago in, in renewable energy in different markets and we're still reaching them in other parts of renewable energy but hopefully reach that point a lot faster and we need to and hopefully we'll get there yeah and i think i think the the because particularly we do have these increasing risks for agriculture um from climate from water and from other places i i think there will be actually pretty if we can get together there'll there'll be a strong incentive to to really sort of rethink our systems and then then create institutional support to, to move towards those more sustainable regenerative agriculture systems so yeah and with that i, I want to thank you so much for for taking the time and sharing your your knowledge wisdom and, and experience in the sector and i'm sure to be to be checking in with you and the many projects uh, you're working on and to to share those updates with a wider audience. Thank you Kun and and, and I congratulate you for for doing this work on regenerative agriculture. It's important work. Thank you. Thank you so much. You just listened to an interview with Dr. Sarah Shear, founder and CEO of Eco Agriculture Partners. We've talked about stranded assets, the need for new institutions, the need for new screening tools for impact investors and for investors what big financial institutions should do to get real on regenerative agriculture. I hope you enjoyed it and will join us again soon for more of these interviews. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soy builders and investors in this space. The soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc, etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No, this is pay what you think it's worth. 
Meaning, I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you. If this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.